Yeah. Okay, good morning. I can see. No, okay. No, so Vivian, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, clearly, Yoshua was very popular. <laughs> Yoshua bin Nun, I'm sorry. I asked Mechila. It's not you, it's me. Uh, I know you like it. So, but we have we have a couple of weeks of Haggadah, and um, yes, um, Chedva slash Vivian slash big sick faker um, was she's she wrote me like all of a sudden oh I've laryngitis I really can't I'm, I don't believe it I think she's which is supposedly coming back you now. know you know what what happened to um, Bikur Cholim and all of that stuff I don't know that's really you if I just hear your voice I can't prove that it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if it's just a picture of the phone, I'll take it. I'm so happy to have you back with us. Um, Thank you. I really was planning on coming today, but I didn't want to make my. I didn't want to get everybody sick. Yeah, oh, you want to get us sick? Oh, okay. You know what? If I, if I had to get sick from anybody, I want to get sick from you. That's what I'm just telling you. That's um, very sweet of you. Listen, I have my notebook. I have my pen. I'm all ready. There you go. There you go. Okay, so we're gonna. We're I ordered gonna... the book. I ordered the book. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do okay. that. I, I sent the link out to the book of what, what we're gonna do, um, but so far we have we have two volunteers. I think we should just start off and get it out of the way, right? Um, so so uh, Rachel Rachel wrote back first. So Rachel's gonna go first. I'm gonna I have to do it on on oh the. Oh boy, uh, yeah. yeah this is like that. big big pressure. You don't have to look at it. Just okay. uh, just so our audience can see you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the splitting of the Red Sea is arguably the highlight of the story of the Jews' exodus from Egypt, and one of the most well known moments in the entire Tanakh. This moment is immortalized in the movie, The Ten Commandments, when Moshe raises his staff and the water instantaneously splits. However, is it possible that just as romantic comedies have been setting unachievable relationship standards for decades, Charlton Heston has set a false expectation for how a miracle should happen? <laughs> According to the Parsha and the Midrash, there was a lot more going on before that Instagram worthy moment. With the Egyptians fast approaching behind them and the sea in front of them, Moshe tells the Jewish people from the Parsha, do not fear. Stand fast and see the salvation of Hashem that he'll perform for you today. Hashem will make war for you, and you shall remain silent. This, it appears, is the ultimate expression of Amuna. Don't worry, Hashem has your back. Hashem, however, doesn't see it that way. The Parsha reads, Hashem said to Moshe, why, are you crying? why do you cry out to me? Speak to the children of Israel and let them journey forth. So which is it? Do we cry out or take matters into our own hands? I believe that the answer, as often is the case in matters of Jewish debate, is both. It is true you can't do anything without Hashem, but still you have to do something. First the step, then the staff. Mm. Psalm 27, which is read every day of Elul, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, closes with this idea of taking ownership and taking the first step. It reads, strengthen yourself, and he will give you courage. Back at the scene at the Red Sea, it actually seems to be the converse. By telling the people to stop crying and <laughs> moving, Hashem is saying, show your courage, and I will give you strength. This message is received by Nachshon, who ventures into the water. According to the Midrash, he is in the water up to his nostrils when the water parts and the dry path forward is revealed for him and the rest of the Jewish people. This unfolding of events allows the Jewish people to become participants in one of the greatest open miracles to ever take place, instead of simply its recipients. It would have, just, it would have been just as easy for Hashem to tell the people to get down on their hands and knees and pray or beg for mercy in a display of his omnipotence. But instead, generations and generations later, we have not the image of our ancestors curled into a ball at the edge of the sea at the prospect of a seemingly insurmountable challenge, but instead the mental picture of facing a challenge with heads held high, marching forward. And so the obvious question is, can we do the same? Although this idea of facing a challenge head on can be applied to countless obstacles that we face, I was particularly interested in one idea put forth by Rabbi Natan, the chief disciple of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who really seems to be ahead of his time in terms of understanding of mental health almost 200 years ago. He said that we find ourselves overwhelmed by our thoughts from all sides and they are engulfing our minds, like the Jews being surrounded but from every side. We should not pay any attention or be deterred from our mission, but rather continue forward into tefillah, chesed, and studying of Torah in order to do our part to merit the splitting of the sea. These ideas have helped me overcome challenges in my own life, weighing when is a time for prayer and when is a time for action, and realizing in hindsight that when I thought I was up to my nostrils, I was really only up to my ankles. And Hashem was encouraging me to keep going, strengthening not only my faith in him, but also in myself. Uh, as always, no one could put it better than Rabbi Sachs of Fanula Racha, who wrote, I believe that some of the greatest positive changes in our lives come when, having undertaken a challenge, we cross our own Red Sea and know that there is no way back. 
there's only a way forward. Then Hashem gives us the strength to fight our battles and win. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, you, you, you ever consider writing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you you be sure. No, I know. Great show. Wow. Well, no, you have to send that. Can you? Yeah, forward that. That is amazing. I, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of things. Well, well, you're all, you, yeah. you said I gotta, I gotta read You don't need me anymore. Like, what else? And so many sources. I love that. Okay, so the, the, I've had like a thing about the splitting of the sea bouncing in my head for a very long time. So this wasn't really all okay. in the last week. But okay. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Send it to us. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Fried, I'm not sure you want to follow that, but I'm just saying, you know. I'll take it on. Okay. This is from Dennis. Prager's Haggadah, which I love. Um, and I chose this because of its relevance to October 7th. So Dennis Prager says, after he discusses uh, the Manish Tana, the four questions, he poses four questions for the adults at the mm -hmm. table. He says, if God took the Jews out of Egypt, why didn't he save the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust? The most honest answer, this is Prager, is that God allows bad things to happen to good people because he has given us free will. If God were to intervene to save every individual, human beings as we know them would not exist. Also, if evil were not possible, nor would good be possible. Returning to the specific question posed here, why didn't God intervene in the Holocaust as he did during the Exodus? In attempting an answer, it is important to bear in mind that God allows centuries to elapse before intervening to end the Jews suffering in Egypt. For hundreds of years, he allowed their enslavement, and he did nothing to prevent the murder of their baby boys when, par when Pharaoh felt threatened enough by their numbers to order that all male Hebrew newborns be thrown into the Nile. So then, if we are to attribute the end of the Egyptian enslavement to God's intervention, we could also attribute the end of the Holocaust to God's intervention. Of course, it doesn't explain why God first allowed six million Jews to be murdered, but neither does the Exodus explain why God first allowed generations of Jews to suffer and near the end, the baby boys to be killed. All we can say for certain is that the Jewish people survived Pharaoh and the Jewish people survived Hitler and the Nazis. Does God have a hand in the survival of the Jewish people? I believe so. Of course, it's a belief, it cannot be proven, but it is the best explanation for the Jews' utterly unlikely survival across 3,000 years, something no other people dispersed from its homeland achieved. Finally, nowhere in the Torah is it implied that God will prevent the murder of a single Jew. What the Torah does promise is that God will never allow the Jewish people to be annihilated. And it just, it resonated with October 7th. So I chose that. Oh, man. Sorry, oh, man. man, I'm out of my league here. I'll just tell you. I don't know. <laughs> Uh wow, that's a we're off to a fantastic start. Thank you. So uh anybody wants to take it on I, I by the way, I appreciate it. It's not it's out of your comfort zone. It's not the easiest thing to get up in front of your peers and to first of all to produce something and, and then give it over. It's not it's not the easiest thing. Um and anybody wants to go, please let me know if you want to go. I'm not I'm not requiring you to do it. I'm just saying you have to do it. Uh <laughs> especially even if you have laryngitis. But um I'll, you can write it. I'll I'll read it for you. The, okay. So as I'm I'm been I work on Pesach already well before Purim because we do this whole thing for the for the men's club and I just just trying to put ideas and I I try to do a theme so the theme this year is kind of I guess you know staring in the face and it's and it's October seventh you know we have a this Sunday it's exactly six months it's uh it's it's April seventh which is just you know mind boggling, um but I'm. And then I keep saying is that, you know, my I, one of the things I view my job as is to give people kind of like hope and encouragement and uplifting and, and positivity. So uh, Pesach is ripe for that. It's really it's really ripe for that. So the first thing that I want to do is something unusual that I've never done before here. And by the way, um, as you can see, this has somewhat marked up my uh, but this is one of the original ones. If you, I'm, I'm looking at Gail's if you, just to show you what drives people crazy. OK. This is one of the questions. This is the hardcover. Okay. This is mine is one of the first ones when they first printed it and it just had a jacket sleeve. But look how they spell Haggadah on the side. <laughs> one with an H and one without an H. Okay. So I mean, if Corin can't even make up their mind, so uh, maybe because this was this is you know what? This is before Corin published it. This is the original one, and this is when Corin. So Corin Corin holds without an H. I hold with an H. Like do you say Rosh Hashanah with an H at the end? Or Hanukkah, or well, Hanukkah, you can spell nineteen different ways. But um, so, what I want to do first, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, one of the things that I think it's very important to do when getting ready for Pesach is to listen to music. 
Now, I don't know what your taste of music are. I mean, certainly when you listen to these kids today with them, that's not music. And all the music today, they just take old music and reproduce it and they get the music. I'm like, oh, I know that riff. That's from, you know. Um, so one of the things that has, if, if you haven't been swept up by, by Ishai Rebo, then you're just simply not breathing. Um, I mean, you're just not, you're just not, you know, so he's just unbelievable. His koach, I don't know how to describe it, but he has a certain adinut. He has a certain just pleasantry about the way he he presents. And he's such like a regular nice guy. Uh, if you haven't seen him in concert, or if you just haven't seen him or just heard him, it's it's really amazing. So this this song, which I came across, it's the, I'm giving you the Hebrew and the English lyrics. Um, and I'm going to play it, of course. And I think it's a great, I think it's a great, it's two pages. Each. I mean, and I think it's just great. Maybe even, I, I know it's not Seder friendly uh, because playing music at the Seder. Uh, but if you, um, you could, um, you could. <laughs> and it's called Ani Shayach La'am. And what caught me, what, what caught me on the song when I was listening to it, what? Yeah, I mean, so, but I don't know what, like, uh, now that everything becomes popular again, but what, what struck me is because he throws in, if you look in the lyrics, and it's a, uh, there's like a, a, like a Manish Tana riff in it, okay? So, I'm going to play the song. I'm not holding, I didn't get... I didn't get I didn't get the People magazine edition on on Ishai Rebo, so um I didn't see behind the scenes either the uh you know behind the music right the their FTV is doing it um okay so let me just pull up the song I have it here I have my kids my kids have to send it to me okay all right so listen to this I'll play it on so we can have it as well So, um, 
first of all, I know when I'm going to upload this to YouTube, I'm going to get all kinds of error messages saying, you know, there's copyright infringement laws, isn't that? Uh, I'm just like, no, you should let me, he let me. He, 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 right? um, you are going to be on YouTube and you will, you will be seen by tens of people. And most of them are here, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know who the most religious, other than my mother, the most religious YouTube watcher of our Shia is? Oh, so there you go. Yep. Yep. And she saw it. She's like, I saw that live. <laughs> um, so first of all, you could hear um, the the Manishtana riff, uh, right? So if you if you really want to do some investigation, there's also an Omer Adam song, which also has a Manishtan riff, but a very, very different meaning of his song. He's not a religious person. I um, mean, he's a soulful person. Uh, and he I think he since has moved to the Emirates or something. Uh, he left his religion in, in, in Dubai, but he wrote about how he, he has a sort of, um, what's the what's that term when people are great, but they don't believe they're really great? Um, no, no, no. Um, 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 imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like when it's imposter syndrome. Like, ah, oh, I'm not really that talented. I'm not. I'm, by the way, you're pretty talented. So, mm -hmm. but but you should. So, so look at the. But look at the. Imagine this. Like, if you, even if just to read the lyrics, to say like, why are we sitting at a Pesach seder? I belong to a nation, the oldest in the archives. I belong to a nation that no historian understood. I belong to a nation as well as the nature from beneath it. I belong to a nation from before whom a great sea fled. Ah, see, mm -hmm. see. <laughs> the seesaw and fled. That's the original seesaw in the Torah. The seesaw and fled. I belong to a nation that will yet merit to see the end. I belong to a nation about which every philosopher has philosophized. I belong to a nation of whom logic does not grasp. I belong to a nation for whom the miracle was created. By the way, that's if ever there was a line that logic does not grasp, the famous Mark Twain line, et cetera, et cetera. Like, we shouldn't be here on paper. And we certainly shouldn't be the cause of every single evil in the world at the moment. That clearly everything that's going on in the world is our fault, right? And by the way, it's not in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Gaza. It's in Teaneck, New Jersey, mm -hmm. right? If you saw what was going on there last night, I mean that's 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 the problem. That's you know that it's our fault clearly. So how does my nation differ from all the other nations? From all other nations that the idols of all other nations neither see nor hear nor hear, see nor hear. It's the sing song and the nation to which I belong. Hashem is its God. And the nation to which I belong, Hashem is its God, right? So man, Ishtana, Am Hazer, right? So you can see the uh, uh, the lyric. I belong to a nation that has survived every era. I belong to a nation that no scientist has developed. I belong to a nation that believes in the sages. I belong to a nation that walks innocently with its father. I belong to a nation that called out, "He who is unto God to me," um, and I it was Hashem Olakim. I belong to a nation which also belongs to me. I love that. Mm -hmm. I belong to a nation which also belongs to me. I'll send, by the way, those, I'll, I'll send the lyrics out if anybody, obviously it's not here in person, um, but I will, I love that. I belong to a nation which also belongs to me, which is, the, I think, the essence of Seder night is belonging, um, which is why when we get to the the sons, the four sons, or nowadays we probably can't even say that. It's probably like, probably get DEI or something <laughs> if you say the four sons. <laughs> So you have to say the the four humans that we birthed, <laughs> or I, I, can you say humans even? I don't even know. Four children, yeah, you, can, you know. But my name is a generic term. But we the 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 four, oh, there's all kinds. Even the Russia has a seat at the table, okay. Um, even the the wicked son has a seat at the table. And by the way, we should and I can say it enough every single year is that at least he comes. The one in America that we struggle with is the son, the child that doesn't come, the one that's completely not affiliated. Um, which, and and I think that the, um, the the struggle today, this year particularly, is very very real. You know, I have a lot of, I speak a lot with my uh, conservative and reform colleagues just because like they need a lot of physic. They really really do because they feel so unbelievably alone uh, when they sat and they. And they march for Black Lives Matter, and they sit up for the Women's March, and on and on and on and on and on. And now it's crickets, and they say like, I don't know, like I don't know where I belong. Um, it's really, can you, and just imagine like for us, man, like not a big deal, you know. Um, but for for a lot of people, it's a very very trying time. They don't know how to respond to people. They don't know where to put themselves. They don't know. So, um, we we belong to a nation, but the nation belongs to us. So I belong to a nation that the chosen. And from another that I belong to, I think, I sing. So how does my nation differ? On and on. It, it's also a great springboard for conversation at a Seder table. Especially if you have a diverse crowd, then you can kind of discuss 
what is it about our nation that that holds you or what is it that you have to give to our nation right what is it that you have like what what's going to be your mark on the world All right um we had a uh we had yesterday we had a, a funeral in the family my wife's favorite aunt passed away um she was you know young by today she was 70 73 uh but she very young and she had uh her husband actually he died way way too young and uh 10 years ago the yard side is next week so we're actually like we knew this was coming we're like they're like mom could you at least like give us a little more time for pesach more than dad did when <laughs> when dad died he you know they got up from shiva and they had to go like a couple days into pesach mm -hmm. Um, and I remember that because I was at a, uh, it was a, it was a memorable moment for our family, for me particularly, because he always told me, by the way, Moshe is named for him. Moshe mm -hmm. has like seven names. So one of his names is for uncle Jason. And, uh, he always told me that I had to speak at his funeral. That was like a request of his. So, okay. I'm doing a destination wedding in Florida that weekend. And we find out right before Shabbos, the wedding was, it was a whole weekend of her thing. I'm in the O hotel in Palm beach. Lovely, lovely place to visit. <laughs> and and we find out that he that he was like really not doing well. We find out right after Shabbos that he died. So Sarah actually just she got the first flight she could to get home in time for the funeral. She made it just in time. I couldn't obviously I had, I had to do this wedding, but I spoke, but it was before Zoom. This is 10 years ago. So I spoke on the phone. It was one of the best eulogies I ever gave in my life. And I'm sitting in shorts and a t-shirt <laughs> in 82 degrees. And <laughs> it's the weirdest thing to deliver eulogy on the phone when you can't see anybody. Okay, now this coming weekend I have a destination wedding in Florida that I have to officiate, and I was like, "Oh my God, not again!" <laughs> but she, uh, she, she was a Rachmanis already, and actually we got to see her a couple of weeks ago. It was the last time she was actually outside, out of bed, really. And we sat outside with her, we laughed with her. Um, but one of the things that they said about her is that you know she grew up um, completely not religious, and her husband, so that's my my wife's uncle. So my wife's uh, father is one of six brothers. So her uncle, he was the oldest, and um, they had a minimal, you know, like a conservative upbringing, conservative shul upbringing, minimal uh, sort of uh, Jewish knowledge. He was busy in the family business. They were running this big flower business for many, many years, Midtown Florist in Brooklyn. And um, so they were living in Staten Island. And then for some reason or another, they decided to enroll their oldest child at the time, my wife's first cousin. Um, they enrolled her in a Jewish school. And they mentioned that they were <clears throat> sitting in a restaurant and they were eating and wasn't, I don't know, you know, classically kosher mm -hmm. uh, or at all. And they bring out the food and the daughter, who's now in Jewish school, she says to the parents and she says, uh, mommy, daddy, like, what bracha do we make on this? <laughs> not knowing that it's not kosher, but because she goes, and it was like a thunderbolt moment for them. And then she said, all right, we need to decide. Like, what are we going to be? Like, if we're in, we're in. But we can't be faking. We can't do things halfway. And from that moment on, they decided that she, you know, she's going to raise her kids in an Orthodox home. Mm -hmm. And she was going to conduct herself in Orthodox lifestyle, which she did for the remainder of her life. She was known as the Rebetzin in the family. Um, and, you know, and it was, it was a challenging thing in the, and, and that business, the family, the business, like for, for my wife's grandfather for many years, he worked on Shabbos. That was just, that was just how it went. You have to run a business, you work on Shabbos. And, um, and that's who she was. And she was like, just completely like her house was always open to people. And so I, I said to my nephew who mentioned this, I said, that's exactly the, the phrase in the Gemara uh, the phrase in the Talmud that says, Ye shekonem olam hababa sha'a achas. You tell the, there's two, it's on two different blot. It's actually one page away from each other in Gemara and Avodah Zarah, and the story of Rechanina ben Tradion. We read about him in the Ten Martyrs, you know, and they wrap him up in the Sefer Torah, and they put the sponges of water on his heart to prolong his death. And the executioner, like, and the students are there, and they're saying, you know, Rebbe, what do you see? Like, the annoying students are like, he's like, I'm dying here. Can you leave me alone? Like, this is not the time. And then he's like, I see the letters going up, and the executioner says, like, if I hasten your death, will I get rewarded? And he said, yes. So he pulls the sponges away, hastens his death. And the executioner is so moved by it, he throws himself into the fire and he dies as well. And then a heavenly voice comes down from heaven. It says that both Rabbi Hanina ben Trajan and the executioner are accepted into the world to come. And then Rabbi Kiva, he says, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva cries and he says, Yev shekonim olam haba b'sha achas. There are those that acquire olam haba b'sha'a achas. In one, like in a second. 
So that's just like, so, so I don't, I don't recommend that path <laughs> of like, you know, just doing whatever you want. And in the last second, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll be good now. Now I'm in. It does not, it does not work like that because we don't have the playbook. But what Rabbi, my Rebbe told me, Rabbi, Rabbi Shachter always says to us, he says that if you look in the Chumash, the first time that the word Sha'a occurs, anybody gets this, this will be remarkable. I mean, that's like extra bonus gold star points. I mean, a raising. It's back to the story of Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel. Cain brings his offering and Abel brings his offering. Which one was accepted? Abel, Abel Hevel. And what happened to Cain's offer? It says, El Cain ve al Minchaso. Lo sha'a. Lo sha'a is the word. So there it doesn't mean hour. It doesn't mean time. What does sha'a mean? Sha'a means that Hashem didn't pay attention. Hashem didn't turn. Now, it could be that the word sha'a is related to the word turn because the way a clock turns. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's why it's related. I, I don't know. But it didn't turn. So um, the so what does that mean, though, then? Yeshikonim Allah b'sha'acha. Sometimes if you just make one pivot, if you just turn, you change one thing, you know what? If you if you want to think mathematically, um, which I try not to do, as I told you that my horror story is about last week. But if you just turn one degree, the entire trajectory of your life and everything that comes is different. Shachas, and that's what we do. We say sometimes we need to do one thing. So, you know what? She was uh, she was an incredible, incredible woman. It was a tremendous, tremendous loss for our family. Uh, sad. We gave her a nice, uh, a nice send off. Uh, my wife's family is very, very, you know, animated. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. And they also, they're all Kohanim. So they have this, we were in Long Island and they have like a Kohen trailer and it was like packed. It was like, like there was no, not enough room in there. And what's also nuts is, so my, my wife is the oldest of, in her, just on her five, you know, and her as a child of six, six children and, you know, six, she has a father and six, five uncles. There are, she's the oldest of 37 grandchildren. Rucheli, Arachely is the oldest up until yesterday morning of a hundred grand great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And after the funeral, the mom who was there went into labor and had the hundred, I think it was a hundred first, a girl. Mm -hmm. A girl. So they're all like, you know, it's a good name, right? But her Hebrew name was Lata. So I don't think I mean and I I wouldn't I, I can't expect anybody in their right mind to name their kids Lata. Um it's Yiddish. It's Yiddish, Yiddish. I don't think there's a Hebrew for Zlata. Yeah. That's my great grandmother. Yeah, that's that's the loose translation. Yeah, okay. yeah. But Zlata was a, was a coin. It was like a, a yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody named his name So it's it's that's also if you, I, I I've shared it with you in the past, but if you want, it, again, th this is an excellent excellent Haggadah. If you if you have if you don't have it, I highly recommend getting it. Um, also, if you have younger people at the table, I don't have it with me right now. I think I have it at home. Um, NCSY published a Haggadah a few years ago, and it's phenomenal. It's like one thing per page. It's big, colorful, lots of good things. And in it, they have the essay from Bruce Feiler. Bruce Feiler, who, who wrote a number of books, Walking the Exodus, and he talks about the you know a lot of family stuff, and he's gone through a lot of personal family stuff, so he writes about it. But he writes about telling the story of your life and the story of your family. And in the story of your family, there's always an arc in the story. We were successful. We were persecuted. We were exiled. We came back. We were poor. We got wealthy again. We got big again. You know, like that kind of thing. And that's what Pesach is about. And a lot of it is about Shua'aka. Sometimes who knows that one person knew one person who got us out of Europe. Or because in 1937, for some whatever reason, we decided to go to America and, you know, everybody else who stayed and look what happened, you know, like all these types of things, you have to tell the family story. And I know everybody like your, your, your families are rich with these types of stories. And that's really the microcosm of what the Pesach Seder is. And the Pesach Seder is, is, is had Hashem not taken us out of Egypt, anu v'neinu, v'neinu, we'd still be, we and our children would still be slaves to Egypt in Teparo in Egypt. And that's the whole, that's the whole uh, uh, message there. So um, it's called, I think it's called One Question. If I'm not mistaken, but it's a thin, big, I just like under NCSY that's not come up. So, what, what's the other option? I think I one question. Um, the one question Haggadah, it could be. I don't know if it's the but no, maybe if you take a picture of it, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. I will. I will. I will. But I'm because I'm, I'm, now it's gonna bother me. Um, 
You know, um, what's his name was very involved in it. Um, David Bashevkin. Um, um, if you don't listen to the 1840 podcast, you should. Yeah, it's called Just One. Um, this, it's, 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 this is what it looks like. Okay. It's thin. I, I, I'm not sure where you can buy it from. Um, if to order printed, uh, uh, visit this page. I guess oh, manuchapublishers.com. Okay, um, but I'll I'll send a link. I'll send a link to everybody for that for that Haggadah as well. Do you think the person needs to be whatever the age is? For that, even probably like uh, middle school. Uh, yeah, even middle school for sure. Uh, yeah, it's it's very very good. Yeah, that would be good for job. Right, have it on Amazon. I think they have it on Amazon. Oh, yeah, have everything on Amazon. It's here, just one. But it's I mean, it's this is it. Right. How much are they charging for it? Fifty-eight dollars. What did you put in your search? There's only three left. So then you have to look. You know what? Look in the Judaica stores. We'll have it. Why? It's less expensive. Yeah. 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 It doesn't say. um Yeah. No. Yeah. So if you go, if you go, if you call, I'm sure like some of the Judaica stores will have it. Um, if you're going to go eichlers.com or if you want to go to Judaica House and, and then you're going to be in Teaneck. <laughs> Although I was there, I did not see that they had it because it was published by NCSY. It's not a mainstream publisher. That's probably why, but it's very, very good. It's, and if you look on that site online, on the NCSY site online, they actually have some of the content. You'll see what it is. Okay, so that's that's that. I also, I want to recommend this. There's They're publishing so much stuff from Rabbi Sachs, which is amazing. Um, and just wait, later on in the summer, we're going to get a new publication, which I'm really excited about. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, so this is uh, developed with Daniel Rose. So they actually have two, it's called Covenant Conversation for Families. Now they have two volumes on the Torah, two volumes on the Chumash, and then they have this one volume on the holidays. Okay, and you know it's current because it says Hagim. <laughs> Okay, Karen is very particular about using the Encyclopedia Judaica Vashon Halachas of writing English and Hebrew. It's like, you know, the Quran with a Q, right? Like that. It's kind of how they write street signs in Israel, right? Oh, Hagim is Hagim, H-A-G-I-M. Okay, so the way, the way I'll, I'll just want to go through some of it with you and the way, and and by the way, this, what this, what this volume covers, again, this is a wonderful investment or you know, let's say you're going somewhere for for a meal or visiting someone. It's a wonderful gift. You know, we there's so much chocolate could you send and wine. A oh, wine is all. Keep sending wine. Wine is good, but um, the 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 I want to just read you the table of contents. The table and it's and it's by the way, it's it's so nice to look at. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres, Hanukkah, Tu B'Shvat, Purim, Pisah, Yom Hashoah, Yom Hazikaron. Yom Hatzmaut, Yom Yerushalayim, Shavuot, the three weeks. This is a gift that keeps on giving. You give this, imagine, let's say you're invited to somebody's Seder and you bring this as a gift. It's such a meaningful gift. And, you know, uh, um, or your, you know, kids are asking, like, I'm going somewhere, what should I bring? It's And and, and this is not, and I bought it in the Judaica house, but it's the Judaica house loves putting on these stickers on. They're like, we sell it for $26 and Amazon is $29 <laughs> in that store in Teaneck. It's like, it's a, it's a fun store. Um, okay, so I want to just go to Pesach, just to give you an idea of what's in here. Um, it starts off, uh, Seder, uh, Pesach, I can't, it's P-E-S-A-H, but there's a dot under the H. <laughs> it's like, you got to be real intellectual smart to like, no, like, Okay, like this is like journal publication type of stuff. Pesach, can you do Pesach? Okay, no. Um, Seder night is the highlight of the Jewish calendar for parents and children alike. It's the night that revolves around children and parents are reminded of the importance of their role as educators. Thankfully, the Haggadah gives them lots of tools and tips. Okay. Um, and also just, um, I, I mean, I don't have to say it, but I, I do keep saying it and we actually, we do it. Um, it's going to be not not this week, but the following week we do a, a Shabbos with the H Tikva. Um, because it should never be lost on us that there are a lot of people closer than we think who have trouble having children. And Pesach is a huge, huge trigger. It's, it's, it's to the extent where families who are suffering with this don't want to go to Seder at anybody's house because 
it's you know when when the pressure of just being in a Jewish community and people can't have children and you know walking into shul and tripping over the baby strollers and every announcement is in the bris and shalom zocher and blah 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 blah, blah you know um, it's very very hard so we have to be extremely sensitive and and that's one of the reasons why we do that Shabbos we we've been doing it since the beginning we do the special prayer we do it on Simchas Torah I think it's one of the more meaningful events that we have uh, throughout the year although this year was a little bit wacky because it was. October 8th, but um, we have uh, actually a, a mom in the shul who um, struggled with infertility for many, many years, and she reads the prayer. Before we have all, we have all the children under the chuppah, and we have all the, we have all the, you know, the, the kids there, and to make a prayer that the Hashem should answer the prayers of those who want to have children. Um, so when you talk about a night that revolves around children, if the whole night revolves around children, and you don't have children, or you can't have children, or, you know, it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it's excruciating. Um, so Rabbi Sachs explains that on the eve of the original Pesach, at the very moment when the new chapter of life and the Jewish people began, we found out what it means to be a Jew. About to gain their freedom, the Israelites were told that they had to become a nation of educators. And this he writes in a letter in the scroll. Um, that's all, I mean, I, I don't need to recommend his books to you, because it, but if you want to take something on and read, read any of Rabbi Sachs' books are, are amazing. The only one I would just say is uh, um, the one that's called uh, One Nation, he wrote it sort of early on in his career, and it's a little bit more complicated. It wasn't meant necessarily for the masses, so it's a lot more, you know, scholarly as opposed to his later writings, which were just sort of, wow, this is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember just discovering by accident, somehow I got into an email list for Covenant and Conversation, probably in early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is it's gold. It's literally gold. And, and they would send out a, a weekly Devar Torah with the sources printed as well. You can make a shear out of it. You can make a sermon out of it. I always I said that I don't know how many rabbis must have like, you know, plagiarized Rabbi Sachs before he became famous. He wasn't so well known then, but it was unbelievable just the way he writes and the way he presents. So uh, being a Jew means being both a student and an educator. The Seder night is our opportunity to focus on both these roles. And what's interesting also is coming off the heels of an Hapachu, is that often, and it happens in our generations, that sometimes, and we aspire for this also, our kids know more than we do. So the kids become the educators, and we become the students. That's a nice thing, by the way. I mean, is there a greater nachas? Uh, I, I, for years and years, I, I probably, when I came back from yeshiva in Israel, and then from then on, my father, Zechron Lebracha, let me run the Seder. And it's only like, maybe recently, like, I don't know, yesterday, that I realized what chesed that was because I would ramble on and on and on thinking that anybody was remotely interested in me reading my sheets <laughs> and the this and the gemara and the thing and, the, and, the, and nobody had the decency to say, would you shut up? Like, we don't know what you're talking about. I get that you know what you're talking about, but stop it, okay? Just This isn't speak to anybody. My, my father would just sit there smiling. He would sit there with, with just absolute nachas, um, my mother found a reason to go in the kitchen and prepare stuff, I guess. When I, but like to give like a full, like it's not the place to give a full shear. And I remember sitting there with like, okay, now question number three, question number 87, question. And I, I was too young to know the difference. I was dumb. You know, I haven't gotten much better. And, but you know what? But I understand that also from my father, it's like that I had the educational opportunities that he never had. And that I was able to share words of Torah and you know what? He was, when I went into the profession that I'm in, he was so unbelievably proud. Like, I can't believe your kids are out. I was like, are you kidding me? It's the best thing in the world. He goes, he, 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 he's, he's a teacher. He's, he, he's, you know, in the Jewish world. What, what a great, I never, I, my father was self-taught. So this section serves as an educational companion to Seder night. And we'll give you some ideas and thoughts on several of the core pages from the Gada and how Rabbi Sachs understands them. As well as offering educational insights, like the other sections of this book, the Seder Night Companion also includes activities, stories, and reflection questions designed to engage all the participants around your Seder. So if you need help how to run the Seder or things that can sort of bring people out, because often we have very different types of crowds at our family, at our Seder, some of it related, some not, some we like, some not. Usually the ones not are the ones that are related, um, but there's, not, there's nothing we could do, okay? And sometimes you're in a place which is conducive to, you know, these types of conversations. Sometimes if you're in a massive room at a program or something, it's very hard to, to do that. Um, so um, the if you have, if you know who your crowd is going to be in advance, and by the way, it could be very different, Seder 1, Seder 2, the crowds that you have. So finding ways to engage, and, and I think the 
best thing that you can do also is if, is to put the work in now. Put the work in now, and then if you know it's going to be there, and you hand out, you delegate, you say, here, uh, you don't have to do anything. Just could you read this question in advance? I'd like, I'm going to print it for you. I'm going to send it to you. Could you read this question? Or could you think about this issue? Or could you just share this to our Torah? Or could you sing this song? Everybody likes to have parts. If they know in advance, they don't want to be put on the spot, right? Imagine if I would say today, we'd walk in today, and it's like, okay, Rachel, give it to our Torah. <laughs> Like, I, I'm, I am. She's like, I'm pulling a head, but I'm never coming back ever again. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. She's coming. She's like, <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm forever. Um, but because the preparation and part, and by the way, and tell me if I'm wrong, but there's something fulfilling in the preparation. Right? There's when, when, when you, you know, oh, I like this idea. And I, maybe where I can find this. And I'm happy to help anybody, by the way. Um, so, he goes through different parts. So let, let's take, I'll take a, for instance, uh, uh, Manishtana. Okay, Manishtana, <clears throat> everybody can relate to, right? You could, you could, you could bring out the, 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 tell somebody in advance to listen to the song, give them the lyrics and say, okay, okay. Um, in a nutshell, it goes like, in a nutshell, deep dive, further thoughts, reflect, and questions to ask at your Seder. Okay. It's, it's, it's like clearly laid out. It's also when they have nice glossy pages, it's very attractive. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are four places in the Torah where it speaks of children asking questions about Pesach. In each of these four verses are the sources for the four questions we have. This inspired a tradition that the story of Exodus from Egypt must be told wherever possible in response to the questions asked by the children. And this is where the idea of the four questions of Manishtana comes from. The origin of the text is the Mishnah, and it talks about the carbon. It's fine. So that's like, if, if you have people that say, by the way, where does this come from? Now, I'm not recommending that you start with this, but if you have people that are inquisitive and they want to know, by the way, where did the world does this come? Well, actually, you should know. There's four verses and it comes in the Gemara and the Mishnah, et cetera. Okay. But you know what? That's Leave that for uh, Robert Klibanoff when he's back from Yeshiva in circa 1990. Um, deep dive. The Torah has two words for inheritance, Yerusha and Nachala. And they represent two different ways in which a heritage is passed on across the generations. Okay. So here I, we have Baruch Hashem, we have the Hebrew teacher par excellence, extraordinaire, okay? And this is what she would, uh, I'll, I'll do it in Hebrew, okay? Um, the word, uh, sorry. The, <laughs> the word Nachala comes from the word Nachal, which means river. It represents an inheritance that is merely handed down without any work on the part of the recipient as water flows in the river. Interesting, right? Nachala, right? Yerusha, by contrast, means an active inheritance. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch pointed out that lareshet, the verbal form of Yerusha, sometimes, sometimes means to conquer. Lavo lareshet et ta'aretz, or to capture. It means actively taking hold of what one has been promised. An inheritance for which one has worked is always more secure than one for which one has not. Okay? Ask anybody who's ever been in a family business or is in a family business, or is surrounded by a family business, present company excluded. Um, but, you know, the, the, the legend of the family, the, like first generation builds it, <laughs> second generation grows it, third generation blows it. That's what they say. Right? <laughs> no, I said present company excluded, okay? <laughs> um, but, but, the, 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 but sometimes you have, you have kids or whoever, they grow up standing on third base thinking they heard a triple when they never had to do anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why Judaism encourages children to ask questions. When a child asks, they have already begun the work of preparing to receive. Torah is a Yerusha, it's not a Nachala. We say, Torah tziv alonu Moshe, Morasha kila Yaakov, Morasha, right? It's the best place on earth, right? Yeah. Morasha, although they won't take my son. Do you believe that? that? Too little. He's the right age, wrong grade. Um, Do you believe that? So he's going to have to go repeat it next year. It's they go by grade. You know, I I respect them. They stick with their with their with their you know. And no matter how many calls from Marcy, they still wouldn't let him in. It's good. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay. He's going to love me. Yeah, they'll take him. <laughs> you know, as long as he's out of the house, that's exactly. that's what's important. Okay. He's going with Ethan's friend Noah then. Okay. Look, I know I know some of the people that work in La Vie, so it's good. <laughs> um, so that's why we when we when you ask a question, you've begun the work of preparing to receive. So Torah is Yerusha, it's not Nachala. It needs work on behalf of the child if it's to be passed on across the generations. So it's also a great springboard. 
why do we spend so much time asking questions? What is the value of a question? Is it annoying to ask a lot of questions? What if I don't know the answer to the questions? Is there still value in the question? These types of things. Um, what's the and, and you can have a conversation about how different people learn. It's very, very, as people in education, you know, and, and it's usually parents of kids who are troubles in class or whatever. And they always, oh, no, my kid learns differently. Like, you know, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, they have all these fancy words for it, you know? <laughs> He's like, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's an auditory learner. He's like, my kid's like a stay in the bathroom kind of learner. Right. You know, like, what? <laughs> right. Right. We make up all these fancy terms. Like, oh, just, you know, let's figure out how it works. Right. There's some kids are just, it's just, it's a gate niche. Okay. I'm going to figure out what it works. But by the way, that mean they can never learn it just to figure out what works. That's all. Um, without the fancy terms and the uh, $900 an hour therapists. Okay. Um, but you know, I had what can I tell you? Um, Further thoughts. Religious faith has often been seen as naive, blind, and accepting. That's not the Jewish way. Judaism is not the suspension of critical intelligence. We don't just accept, oh, Hashem says so, good enough. Well, we do on, certain things. on certain things. because, But that's after we've probably asked a lot of questions of like, and then we come back to that and say, yeah, I mean, like you want to talk about the Shoah, you know, it could rock your world and really, but in the end of the day, okay, I mean, I got, I got to accept it somehow or what's going on right now. To the contrary, asking a question is itself a profound expression of expression of faith in the intelligibility of the universe and the meaningfulness of human life. To ask is to believe that somewhere there is an answer. The fact that throughout history, people have devoted their lives to extending the frontiers of knowledge is a compelling testimony to the restlessness of the human spirit and its constant desire to go further, higher, deeper. Far from faith excluding questions, questions testify to faith, that history is not random, that the universe is not impervious to our understanding, that what happens to us is not blind chance. We ask not because we doubt, but because we believe. Mm -hmm. And by the way, every time he quotes something, he tells you where in his book mm -hmm. you can find it. So somebody did a lot of work on this, um, this fellow, um, Rabbi Daniel Rose, uh, did a lot of work on it about calling this together and making, and by the way, and this is for every holiday. This is just the one chapter on Pesach, but that one chapter could be golden for your Siddhar. So reflect. How does Manishtan on the role of children asking questions affect your experience at the Seder? It's cute. It's nice. It's annoying. Like, does every single person and their brother have to sing it? Can we just get the actual youngest kid to do it? Right? I, when I was first married um, and nobody had children yet and, and, you know, no grandchildren. So my wife, she was the new youngest. So. She was, you know, 20 years old. She got married at 20. She's 20 years old, and she couldn't buy wine for the Seder, but she could do the Manish Tana, okay? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, uh, reflection. How is asking questions an expression of faith? Doesn't it show a lack of faith? So we can just, you know, expand on that. And questions to ask at your Seder. Why do you think we encourage children to ask questions on Seder night? Are there any bad questions? Do all the questions have answers? What do we do if no one we know has the answer to a question? And it could lead to, obviously, a very deep conversation about what's going on today and how do we deal with uh, struggles today. There's also, there's a new Haggadah that came out this year. Um, it's a guy, his name is a doctor. His name is, I'll, I'll put, I'll, when, I, when I have the recording, I'll, I'll put all these things in there. Um, if you want to send it to me, I can include yours in there if you want. It'd be easier to send to the group. Um, um, the, the, because I know you have it digitally. Yes, I this a doctor name is Marvin. I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Chinitz or Chinitz, and it's a hadgada that's dedicated solely to Pesach and Zionism. Mm -hmm. cool. And in the back, he has a whole discussion about some very difficult questions and what you want to know. What do you think about uh, the Oslo Accords? What do you think about uh, territories? What do you think about peace process like this? And then he has an afterword, which is actually written October fifteenth. So, um, you know, maybe if you, maybe you want to like roll up the sleeves and put on the boxing gloves at the Seder too. That could be fun. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, but but he, and, and there he actually, so I, I don't have the copy, but there he has an interesting take on Dayenu where he asks, you know, would it be that Hashem didn't do this and going all the way through modern times, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. The last thing he has here is a story for the Night of Stories. Um, Isidore Rabi won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944. When he asked why he became a scientist, he replied, my mother made me a scientist without ever intending to. Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school, did you learn anything today? But not my mother. Izzy, she would say, did you ask a good question today? Mm -hmm. Rabbi Tversky tells a similar story about his mother. Um, asking good questions made me a scientist. Reflect. Are you, invested, are you more invested in your learning when you're encouraged to ask questions? Okay, so a lot of times, it's like, here's another 
great term we use when we, when, you know, I just was involved in planning a very big conference and we have this, they use all these words. I don't understand. I mean, like, but like, oh, we, we want more frontal learning, less frontal learning. I'm like, like, should I be in the back of the room? Like, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm a simple guy. I don't use fancy words. Um, meaning like, do you want someone just speaking at you? Are you want more in interactive? And like, and we found like that that one of the things we came out with is certainly the more interactive groups when we sat with the groups of rabbis together and sharing experiences in a safe space. And I say I could I could create a drink in today's world I could create a drinking game anytime anybody uses the word space. Mm. Oh well, I'm not in that space right now. Uh, well, in in our uh, I'd be drunk before breakfast, okay. And then with all the and and, and more in the liberal community, everything was post this, post that. I'm post-moderate, I'm post-Zionist, I'm post this. I'm like, I'm I'm post cornflakes. Okay. That's what I it's actually Kellogg's. I'm like more fruity pebbles. I'm a post fruity pebbles. Like I'm I'm just like Jewish. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. You guys your fancy words like deep and and intersectionality and my lived experience. Everything goes downhill. And and you're seeing more and more, by the way, left wing left wing academics, left leaning academics who are decrying against it, especially when it comes to Zionism in the in the academic world, of how it's completely been bastardized and it's just ruined everything. Um, so we heard from this woman, uh, if you ha haven't had a chance to read her, um, Rachel Fish. Rachel Fish is unbelievable, unbelievable in fighting this thing uh, uh, on campus. Um, if you want a good journal to read, by the way, and it's available free online, the Sapir Journal, which is edited by Brett Stevens, is phenomenal. I mean, it's just like really good. And so, so even in the most recent edition of the uh, Jerusalem Report, which, by the way, covers a broad array of opinions, and a left-leaning um, scholar wrote about why the two-state solution is not realistic. Coming from a left-wing person, which is just, you know, and, and he like lays it out bullet point by bullet point, um, which I find very interesting and very compelling. So um, I... I I'm just saying, it's been a push at the end. I'm just like, give me the pusik, <laughs> give me the interpretation, and we'll go, we'll learn, and we'll inspire. Um, so I'll, I'll send you a link to this. This is this is such, and by the way, RabbiSax.org online also has a tremendous amount of source material where you could print off his games, activities, things like that. I, you should read it every week, certainly before the holidays. The key is, like anything, you're not going to go into your Seder and like the morning of and say, okay, what are we serving? So the same thing should go for the spiritual meal that you're going to serve at the Seder, which, by the way, is in your hands. It's in your control. Who dictates the flavor of, of the home, of the Jewish home? The Ashish Chayel. Okay, so you have to, as much time as you spend, I know, in the list, and the shopping, and then how many more times can I go to shop right now? I'm not going to go to aisle one. Like, oh, okay, I get it. But still, we have to invest in this as well. And I promise you the benefits will, will far outweigh the effort that you put into it. And if you make that one turn, if you make that one pivot, you spend a little bit more time on this, a little less time on that, uh, I promise you, you'll see, you'll, you'll reap the dividends. It's really real. So we'll, we'll continue next week. Hashem. Anybody wants to volunteer to do so, please let me know. You don't have to say right now. You can just tell me offline privately. When I get the recording, I'll send all this out later this afternoon, hopefully, when I have time. But um, You'll keep at it. Pesach is amazing. Pesach is awesome. And then I also sent a link to that to the book that we're going to study. Again, just the way Rabbi Sachs puts things together is just absolutely tremendous. And um, I'm looking forward. And maybe if you want to do it in Hebrew, by all means, I will do a metagim. Are you going down on Sunday?